Kia ora, nā mihi nui kia koutou and koutou katoa, nā mai hari mai. Welcome to this Mindful Money online seminar. Uh, this is uh, part of a seminar series that we're running uh, on, um, essentially the title is uh, Making Your Money a Force for Good. Um, uh, we'll be telling you a little bit about Mindful Money through, through, the, uh, through the seminar, um, but you can uh, look at the videos that we've already had in the series on our website. Uh, you follow the links to the events page. And uh, this is actually the 10th of our seminar series. Uh, and you can see all of the YouTube videos and, and written summaries of the other uh, nine seminars. And uh, some of them, I, I must say, are fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, with, with, uh, they've been very enjoyable as well as very interesting. So the format for tonight is that we're going to have a discussion uh, between me and our guest, who I will introduce in a second, uh, for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're opening up to the chat. So you can put your comments or your um, questions or, or your brickbats or whatever you want to do in, uh, in the Zoom chat. Uh, but I'm sorry, you're going to be muted on Zoom. And on Facebook Live, you can use the comments section of Facebook Live, and they'll be picked up and, and sent through the Zoom chat to us. So um, please feel free to comment as we go along. Don't wait till the end. Uh, uh, do it as you think of it is always a, a good one. And, and I apologize that you're going to be on mute uh, for, for the call. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, our, honored, uh, our honored guest. Um, uh, we have with us tonight the CEO of uh, Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, uh, and you'll hear us refer to RIAA, uh, that's R-I-A-A. -A. It's Simon O'Connor. And uh, Simon, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, Always enjoy chatting to you, so uh, so uh, very warm welcome. Thanks, Barry. Kia ora. Always enjoy talking to you as well, so thanks for having me. Cool. Um, Simon C, CEO of, uh, of RIA. Uh, RIA is the peak body of, of 250 organisations who are uh, in the, the field of responsible investment, so it includes fund managers, rating agencies, banks, financial advisors, academics, NGOs, and other financial services providers across Australia and New Zealand. Um, Simon's worked as an economist focused on the environment for more than 20 years. Uh, and uh, as he told me, battling climate policy debates in Australia for much of the time, and, and our deepest sympathies to you, Simon, <laughs> uh, as well as working for NGOs to dispel the misconception of a trade-off between environment and the economy. Uh, Simon said one of his uh, more enjoyable tasks was uh, figuring out the economic value of whale watching to local communities, including uh, some work in New Zealand and the Pacific. Uh, Simon walks a talk on sustainability. He grows veggies and uh, keeps chooks uh, and uh, commutes by bike uh, from his home in Melbourne. So very warm welcome, Simon. Thanks, Barry. So, nice to be here. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give you the easy question first. Is can you tell us about the the kind of responsible investment revolution that's been going on internationally? Yeah. Look, I think you're right. I think it's not over plain to call it a revolution because we're now at a point globally where effectively a majority of the financial markets around the world have recognised and have made commitments to say that sustainability issues, environmental issues, issues such as climate change, human rights, these are all so fundamental to understanding how our investments are going to perform that the majority of them are now making public statements saying we commit to looking at these sustainability issues in every investment decision we're making. And so we've come a long way in the last, well, our organisation is now 20 years old, but many of us working in this space for a length of time now, where we have this sort of mainstream acceptance. Um, and I was thinking about the, the three kind of drivers for this, right? And we always need a bit of alliteration here. So I thought of the three C's 
I made this up especially for you tonight, Barry. So, you know, the three drivers that I see are really compliance, consumers, and a competitive positioning. And I think one thing that's going on around the world right now is, is this area of responsible investment has been embedded in financial sector regulation. So you're seeing our regulators, the FMA, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, others talking about how financial institutions must be considering climate change risk now. It's an, it's an obligation, it's compliance, it's no longer a nice to have. So that's coming, that's a global trend that we're seeing playing out. Secondly, consumers. And again, globally, consumers, you and I, in where we make our decisions around where we bank, where we invest our KiwiSaver, where we invest any of our managed funds, increasingly are articulating the desire to invest in a way that's doing good um, and as a minimum avoiding harm. And so that again is this growing wave globally and certainly in our region. And thirdly, I'd say competitive performance. And I think what's really, what we've really discovered in the last five years, and we're now at a position where we have a really good body of evidence to say that these kinds of funds, responsible funds, they outperform the market. They do better in terms of delivering returns to, to clients, to members, to citizens. And, and what that effectively says is the companies we're investing in through these responsible funds are more sustainable companies. They're companies that look after the employees, that consider their community, don't pollute the environment, have better management. These are the companies that make better investments, that um, deliver better returns. And so these are the three kind of factors, I think, that have really accelerated this uptake um, in probably the last three to five years in particular, it's really moved from this niche segment of finance to very much dominating conversations in the financial services sector. So um, it's a revolution. We've come a long way, but I think we might unpack a little bit. We're not there yet. We haven't solved the world's problems through finance just yet. So we've got a little way to go still. Uh, that's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but uh, as you say, we're, we're starting, we're seeing the finance sector at least trying to become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So, so for the audience, you heard the three C's here for the first time. So uh, uh, Simon hasn't got a trademark on it. Um, we, we tend to, uh, we tend to uh, talk about uh, feeling good about your investment, doing good in the world and earning good returns. And, and it's, it's a little bit parallel to the three C's. So um, Simon, um, Bring it to New Zealand. Uh, uh, we, uh, RIA and, and Mindful Money, uh, have cooperated on annual surveys of the New Zealand public over the past couple of years, and, and they've been really illuminating. So um, uh, I wonder if, if there's something that, you, that really struck you about our New Zealand survey, which you would say is different. To, to the situation internationally. What's distinctive about, about our New Zealand situation on, on ethical investing or, or responsible? And throughout the interview, by the way, we'll be talking about responsible investing for most of the members of the public. Uh, think of it as ethical investing. It's a terminology thing. Yeah, great. And I, and I think this consumer research is really important, right? Because financial services sector is a is a servant of the public. We are there to serve and to manage and in, be entrusted with the public's money and retirement savings. And, and so in effect, we should be ensuring we're reflecting the, the public, the, the interests and the uh, values and preferences of our clients. Um, sounds pretty simple, right? But I think perhaps the industry has kind of forgotten some of those core uh, sort of uh, core underpinning expectations and beliefs and what we're what we're there to do and I think that's really pleasing to see we're flipping that back and so it's been great to do that research with you guys and we'll kind of continue to do that because I think it sheds a light on a lot of things um one I think what's really a couple of things stand out one is that we talk a lot about millennials being really interested in aligning their savings with their values and purpose and, and I think that's true and it comes through really strongly in surveys what we often forget though is actually the survey shows also those at the other end of the age spectrum in the retirement phase are also showing that they have a very strong desire to align their investments with their values and their sustainability preferences. And so I think that's actually a story that's probably underdone. And I know Barry, you've tried to point this out a bit too, but it's almost like those two life stages where people are really reflecting on what impact they can have through where they direct their finances and their investments and their savings, which I think is really important. I think the other thing that stood out to me is we asked people with this last survey, you know, what percentage of people would want to avoid investments in industries that are doing harm 
And no surprise, 80% plus want to avoid or exclude or divest or um, of companies in, in industries that do harm. But only 10% said they actually want their investor on their behalf to engage with those companies to shift um, the corporate behaviours around these sustainability issues. That's a really small proportion that recognise and um, that actually there's a lot we can do to shift corporate behaviour through owning these companies. And I think it, it actually is a lesson for us as a sort of industry body who does a lot on education and talking to the public that we have a big job to do to better prosecute the case for why this is important and why actually we can create great change by owning these companies. And so, you know, I'll just give a few examples there. Over the last couple of years, we've, through investor pressure on BHP, we've gotten them to stop being a member of the World Coal Association. Uh, some investors in the US managed to get Walmart to stop selling automatic handguns in their shops in the US. Um, we've just recently seen Shell make commitments to reduce its um, emissions and what we call the scope three emissions, which is the emissions of greenhouse gases from burning the fuels and to set a long-term target around that. And, and probably very few of these could be achieved by divesting these companies. And so there's two things going on here. One, there is the potential to influence change by owning companies, but if an investor is going to choose that as their strategy, as opposed to divesting or excluding, they really need to be able to clearly articulate how they're creating that change and how they're putting pressure on to create that change. So um, sort of says to me that there's a bit of education work for us to do for that sort of understanding of, of how we can affect change to deliver on these big goals that we have as a country or a region around the Paris Agreement, sustainable development goals, because we're going to need that pressure for the finance sector. It's a really important point because uh, many of the industry participants are in fact the dominant way of expressing responsible investment uh, from the industry perspective is through environment, social governance management, ESG management. And uh, two seminars ago, we had a really interesting discussion on that uh, with a panel. Uh, and, you know, it's part of the the, the way that we can bring these issues out for, for uh, people's education. Um, and it's an, it's an active debate. And I think ultimately um, some investors will choose to say, well, thanks very much. That might be true, but I actually don't want to invest in fossil fuels, even if they are trying to clean up their act. Uh, whereas other people are, are going, to, going to want to do that. So it is, uh, it is ultimately going to be a, a consumer preference issue. But uh, um, it's great for us to be raising the, the different strategies and to try and get that uh, better, better known. But, but you also touched on, on something which is the issue of, of credibility. And one of the things that, that I, I think a lot of people particularly know RIA for is your great work on certification. Uh, and particularly for the funds that are using ESG management or using ways to, to engage with, with companies. Can you talk about, about the certification process uh, and, uh, and how that can, can be a, a strong uh, verification tool? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Baron. I think um, this came out in the survey as well, actually, that consumers would be much more inclined to put their money into investment products that had been certified by a third party as being effectively true to label, delivering on their promise and actually being responsible or ethical and so we've had this certification program in place and it's effectively it's like a tick of approval that verifies a product is delivering what it's saying it's doing and has in place really good processes to ensure that there is substance behind the claims effectively um, and so we have some minimum standards but we also respect the fact that there are lots of different types of ethical and responsible investing strategies out there that will meet different kinds of client demand and interest. And so, um, and so, for example, if someone says, yeah, we're, gonna, we're not going to divest of companies, but we're going to engage to create change within those companies, then our expectation and certification is that we would be able to see the evidence of what engagement activities have been undertaken, what the purpose of those meetings were, what change have they affected, and if change is not being driven, then what are you going to do about it? Will that result in divestment at the end? And so we really put in some kind of scrutiny over those internal processes. Um, and look, that's become quite important as a program for us. And there's a big conversation globally around this sort of need 
for verification of claims being made in this sector because we're seeing a lot of consumer interest. And so it's really healthy in our view to see the additional scrutiny, the additional parties coming to look at products and things like what Mindful Money is doing. Our programs certainly intend to sort of support and under, under, underpin some of that. And then effectively to make it easier for a consumer to say, okay, I can trust that there's been an assessment of that product, that they're actually doing what they're saying, that there's some really strong, rigorous processes. Not every consumer wants to get under the hood and get down to that level of detail. We will, we go in there, we audit them, we verify it. Um, and then we give them our little tick of approval. And you know, like for so many other sectors, whether it's green power or sustainable forestry or sweatshop free, you know, there's, there's a real need for that verifier in the market to be doing that detailed work to ensure people are not greenwashing, are not making false and misleading claims and are actually delivering on what they're saying to consumers they're delivering. Cool. And uh, that, that uh, uh, tick of approval is very important for Mindful Money because uh, for all the funds that, that do ESG management, they, we accept that as a form of, of verification. And re, so recertification is, is hugely, hugely helpful. Other funds where, where we can directly see what's in their portfolio and whether then they're excluding things, we, we will allow some funds to come onto the platform uh, and be counted uh, uh, as ethical funds if, if they exclude things that are important to members of the public. So, so it, we're, it, the certification tool that we has is, is uh, hugely helpful uh, for us. Um, so moving, moving on uh, and uh, uh, for those of you on Zoom or on Facebook Live, uh, remember, uh, please put some stuff in uh, in chat because we're coming up to the time where we're going to be looking to answer your questions and comments. So, uh, uh, so start start scribbling. Um, so I'm going to ask you a little bit about the the sort of the move from responsible investment to say, well, what does that mean in the bigger picture? Uh, and there's this term sustainable finance, and we're both part of processes around trying to make uh, the financial system more sustainable uh, in New Zealand and Australia. And so, um, can you kind of give your perspective on so how do we how do we kind of go from the core of what we mean by responsible investing into saying so how how does this play out in making the finance system more sustainable? Yeah, thanks. And I think it sort of reflects a bit of an evolution in our thinking around responsible and ethical investing. Whereas 20 years ago, when it all started, or it goes way back beyond that, it was all about avoiding harmful industries and harmful activities. So we've sort of avoided harm. That's good. Then we came with this big sort of the, the bigger mainstream part of finance who came into this and for this, them it was about avoiding risk you know so they sort of looked at sustainability issues as risk issues to to avoid downside impact on their portfolios and their investment returns we're now shifting into maybe a third focus here which is really about how do we create a positive impact and how do we actually it's really it just acknowledges the fact that when you have 200 billion dollars floating around a financial services sector uh, in New Zealand it has a great impact where that money flows, which companies are supported, which companies aren't invested in, what kind of infrastructure is built, who we lend to or don't lend to. So it's an acknowledgement that the way we invest that money actually shapes the society, shapes the economy, shapes the world we're all living in. And it's taking a proactive view of saying, well, we actually want to shape that in a way that provides long-term prosperity but also well-being and the environment for human flourishing and a, an environment that will continue to sustain human life, let alone other species, um, and really taking a much more longer term perspective on how we're going to shape um, that environment to be one that's more sustainable. And really importantly, it seeks to align that with some of the big international agreements that are really going to define our coming couple of decades, in particular, the Paris Agreement on climate change, to achieve net zero emissions by the middle of the century, we're really gonna need the financial services sector to make sure those investments and those billions of dollars are aligned with those net zero emissions targets, but also the sustainable development goals, the 2030 goals that set out goals as a, as a planet 
that we want to achieve better social outcomes, reduce poverty, improve health, improve education, reduce inequality. Now, these are all things that are sort of grand things we want to support. But fundamentally, I think we're starting to see indications of how if we don't support them and if we don't achieve them, it actually erodes the very economic foundation that underpins, well, all the investments we're making. So you could sort of argue this from a hard-nosed financial perspective as much as an altruistic make the world a better place perspective. And I kind of can use either argument depending on who you're talking to. But I think it's, it's a really important shift that's occurring in financial services to say, yep, we must play a role in shaping this kind of future. And our regulators and governments are seeing that the financial services must be aligning here if we're to achieve Paris, if we're to achieve the sustainable development goals. Yeah, it's going to take a huge change in the architecture. Just uh, one of the issues you alluded to is the short-term versus long-term perspective. And if you're a fund manager who's getting their bonuses determined on kind of how shares do over a three-month period, and so you put pressure back on the companies to, for their three-month earnings, it's very hard for them to think about the longer term issues of sustainability when, when they're struggling to meet their short term profit targets. And, and uh, so, so uh, we've got a, a, a couple of seminars coming up um, over the next few weeks uh, about the Sustainable Finance Forum in New Zealand. Uh, so uh, next week, one of the uh, originators of it, uh, uh, Sir Jonathan Porritt, uh, uh, very much a kind of mover behind this. Uh, he's based in the UK, but has lots of New Zealand connections. Uh, he's coming on. He's particularly going to be talking about climate finance. And then the week after that, in two weeks' time, uh, we've got the uh, uh, two of the Secretariat members for the Sustainable Finance Forum to come on. And, and that's going to be interesting because they're the ones uh, who we talk to a lot about the policy aspects and so uh, so those will be uh, those will be a couple of interesting uh, conversations as as well so I mean your your blog that you put out not so long ago on principles for a responsible recovery I uh, had some really good ideas so do you want to sort of draw on those and, and give us a few and then uh, and then we'll open it up for questions sure and I think um, at a high level, I think we're certainly not the only voice globally right now saying that any response to COVID-19 should be tackling the, the, the multiple other crises, but in particular the climate crisis that has not gone away. And I think there's, a, there's this really strong growing movement and voice uh, around the world right now saying that actually the best way to stimulate an economy, to grow meaningful jobs, to respond to COVID-19, to ensure our economy continues to create a prosperous society for us all actually are the very same policies that will lower climate change um, risk that will reduce emissions and respond to that as well and so we're really just in, in, in amplifying that in the Australian New Zealand context to say that we must ensure that the stimulate the stimulus that occurs is aligned with creating that um, better society and really sets us on train to be achieving our Paris Agreement target so we talked in this blog about the principles for a responsible recovery and we've talk about the need to make sure that this prosperity continues to be inclusive, that we don't lose sight on uh, grounding this recovery in democracy, you know, we've had, um, that we ensure that um, any recovery is participatory, that, you know, what does that actually mean, you know, in the really reflecting the value of the contribution that different citizens and different occupations are making, you know, I think one of the things that's been really stark in the last a uh, few, few months under COVID, but probably six months in Australia, in particular under the bushfires that preceded COVID, is just the, the essential services workers has been absolutely critical to our economy, let alone our society and communities, health workers, education workers, firefighters. So I think um, we really should reset our view of what we value in terms of those kinds of occupations. Um, we should be ensuring that we're aligned to Paris and the SDGs um, and that we're really preparing a more resilient future because we know we're going to see more of these shocks. We're going to see more of these challenges under any of the projections that we have sitting there. And so I think um, what was really encouraging to me was a report that came out of Oxford University about three or so weeks ago that kind of underscored this, that surveyed a whole lot of central bankers and was written by some Nobel laureates and said that, yep, the best stimulus packages we can use going forward are those that are going to reduce emissions and align us with Paris as well, that will also be creating jobs. And so it's really an absolute win-win here. And 
really quite essential that we're tackling both of these challenges at once rather than coming back and having to spend more to ch tackle the climate challenge later. So we're really just adding an amplif amplification to that. And I'm, I've been really encouraged in the New Zealand context to see the momentum that that's got um, and the way so many voices are coming out strongly and the government seems to be really uh, taking that to heart in terms of the importance of that. We've got a bit more work to do in Australia yet, but we're not talking about Australia tonight. So let's stick to the positive mm -hmm. news of the other side of the Tasman. You're absolutely right. There is uh, an absolute clamour of voices saying uh, that, that the recovery needs to be a sustainable recovery, needs to take us on a pathway towards zero emissions, needs to address some of the social problems that have been uh, um, that have been allowed to continue for far too long in, in New Zealand. So, so uh, um, some uh, of our viewers tonight may have come to us via uh, a Vision Week, which is uh, a, a week-long series of seminars that are that are happening. Uh, there's uh, uh, lots of different initiatives going on, and uh, I, I certainly uh, um, share your optimism that there's lots of voices saying it. Um, we just uh, we just hope that the twenty billion dollars that have been earmarked uh, for the rebuilding of the economy uh, really does uh, go to those kind of of uh, initiatives rather than as we've seen in the past the the physical infrastructure and particularly lots of expensive roads. So so uh, um, yes, I think we we need to continue. The pressure in New Zealand for for that recovery to be uh, to be fully sustainable. Um, now let's open up to questions. So we uh, we have one from Facebook. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, the question is: um, Is there an area of the world that that you would say is doing really well on on responsible ethical investment? And uh, contrast a little bit with with Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, so I think probably what we often cite as standing out um, around the world is, is probably some of the European markets, um, particularly Northern European markets, that I think, why do they stand out? They, they have a really sophisticated response when it comes to ethical and responsible investing. They both make a, are very comfortable making ethical judgments that certain industries are doing harm and should be excluded from a portfolio. But they also take a pragmatic view often that if a company redeems itself, uh, you know, responds to an issue and improves its performance, then they'll bring them back into a portfolio. At the same time, you're seeing a lot of them, the pension funds in particular over in Europe, who are really starting to articulate how their investments are aligning with social and sustainability goals and reporting on their contribution to the sustainable development goals. And not just reporting on it, because reporting is just a process. It's actually about then shifting their portfolio to contribute more towards sustainability goals. And I think that's really positive. So they, they, they're avoiding harm. They're really supporting positive impact in their investments. And they've been really strong in their engagement practices to shift corporate behavior. And so I think it's not surprising then that it's a number of big companies in Europe that are finding a lot of pressure from investors right now um, to shift their behavior to start coming out more strongly on their long-term climate change commitments. Um, and so I think that's been really positive I also really like in the UK, there's been some developments there where the pension fund industry there, the KiwiSaver equivalents, have now been required that annually they must actually ask their members, their clients, on what their sustainability preferences are and inform their investments based on that. So there's some, there's some legislative developments that are really putting the consumer back in the centre and ensuring that the finance sector is answerable to their customers and there's a positive requirement they must be asking their customers on their preferences. And I think that really flips things on its head um, where I know many in sort of our part of the world might say, well, we don't hear from our clients much. So we don't really know what their ethical preferences are. So we, you know, we don't feel like we have a mandate to do it. I think the answer to that is make these funds ask their clients their preferences and find out. And, it's really encouraging that in our markets in this region, there is a lot more of that going on proactively and off their own bat of fund managers and KiwiSaver providers really trying to understand their clients' views, preferences, ethical values, etc. So, um, so that I, I really like that those developments in that part of the world. 
Yeah. And, and in the uh, Sustainable Finance Forum, that is uh, something that uh, uh, we've been pressing for to, to say that for in finance advisors, for, as you say, fund managers, they need to be asking the ethical question, what, what kind of ethics do you want in, in your portfolio? So, so that's, uh, that's a great example. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a question, a bit of a challenge to you, Simon. Um, so this is from uh, Margaret Beavis. Thanks, Margaret. It's a really good question. Given the, uh, the new uh, UN treaty uh, for the elimination of nuclear weapons, um, are funds certified by RIA required to uh, divest from all nuclear weapons manufacture? Thanks, Margaret. That's a really good question. Um, I think what it reflects to me is that one of the great challenges and indeed obligations for investment fund managers or super funds, KiwiSave providers, is they need to stay on top of shifting norms and conventions globally. And I think um, when I think about ethical investing, there's kind of international norms and conventions plus ethics. Ethics is sometimes harder. We have some diverse views at times. Norms and conventions should be much easier because if you've got 195 countries signing up to a particular treaty, that would be a pretty good indication that it's not controversial to exclude companies in those sectors. And so I think the challenge then for fund managers, key over providers, super funds, pension funds, <clears throat> is that they really should be informed by these treaties. I think it's a really safe and a and, uh, good foundation from which to, to base some of their investment beliefs, values and exclusions on. And so probably sometimes a bit, um, something I point to a lot in Europe is that you see much more commonly that a convention like that will guide an exclusions policy of a big pension fund. In Australia and New Zealand, you don't see that used as much. I would say that that does inform a lot, particularly New Zealand superannuation funds strategies around exclusions. And I think it's really smart, you know, it's, it's um, uh, so that's a long way of coming to your question, which was a really well pointed one, Margaret. And I would say currently it's not a requirement that our certified funds exclude nuclear weapons, but in fact, it's not really been the approach of our certification to prescribe an approach um, or an exclusionary industry. Um, what I would say is, we see that there's a lot of different approaches to doing responsible investing, impact investing, ethical investing. And the reason we, we sort of restrict ourselves from, from prescribing what people should or shouldn't invest in, and it's one that we debate on a daily basis in RIA, um, is because there are funds out there that are set up purposefully to own a company to change corporate behavior of that company. And so if we said to them, you cannot be certified at, by RIA and own a thermal coal company, then that means that a particular fund manager in Australia who has an advocacy fund whose goal is to shift behaviour of a particular fossil fuel company, that means they couldn't be certified. And actually we see it as having absolute merit as a strategy to shift behaviour through ownership practices. And so we've kind of resisted prescribing the exclusions. Um, that said, you know, I think we as RIA, as a standard bearer, as an owner of a program like that, need to be really cognizant of well, as, well, as well of these sort of expectations from communities, the minimum standards that are expected of responsible and ethical products. And I think that's really largely informed and what, why we find the consumer research we do in New Zealand and Australia really important for us. Because when we see that 90% of New Zealanders don't want to be investing in companies that breach human rights, for example, that's a really strong signal to us that we need to ensure the market is moving to reflect that, that position. So, um, so I'll try that as, a, as an answer, but thanks, Margaret. Yeah, and uh, Margaret, may, maybe you know this, but for the benefit of other uh, listeners, uh, Mindful Money did an analysis of all 270 KiwiSaver funds, and we found that 100 million New Zealand dollars are spent on manufacturing nuclear weapons or spent uh, invested in companies who manufacture nuclear weapons for at least part of their operations. So, so $100 million is a very large investment number. Now on, on our website, you can key in weapons and you can see what uh, funds are entirely weapons free. And then you can look at any fund and you can see what weapons 
they have, how much of the percent of the portfolio, and which companies they're invested in. So it's what we call radical transparency, uh, and it, it gives everyone the chance to see exactly what what is in the, in their their KiwiSaver, and we're extending that to all other forms of managed funds in the in the near future. So uh, uh, so that's uh, that's a, a kind of a way that people can look themselves. Another question, Simon. Um, do we need uh, a, a better definition of fiduciary duty? Great, great question. So this goes to the idea that often those who are entrusted to manage our money feel that they're restricted on how much of a decision they can make around sustainability issues, around ethical values, around creating social impact through their investments and feel there is a deeply entrenched perception that the current laws around fiduciary duty restrict fiduciaries, trustees, um, to only maximising investment returns. Now, we would argue that that is an excessively narrow interpretation of how the law currently stands today and is really actually quite outdated. And so, in a sense, we say that we kind of walk this line where we say, well, no, actually a change isn't required because fund managers, pension funds, Kiwis Over Providers can absolutely do all of what we're saying is really important for them to do. That said, I think gaining additional clarity and some really clear guidance from a regulator to say, no, it's absolutely within your rights to be investing in a way that avoids harm. And this is absolutely consistent with delivering long-term returns as well, by the way, um, is, is really important that that message gets out there because maybe to be frank, there's a whole lot of people sitting as trustees on these big financial institutions who probably are, you know, pretty old, pretty white, pretty male, pretty white haired, who probably have an outdated view as to what this sort of fiduciary duty kind of is. And I say that with some some respect and I'm, you know, I, um, but but it is, it does in that sense require clarity from a regulator to say, actually, we've got an updated view as to what that really means and what it really means for an investor to deliver long-term returns and the best possible outcomes for members and clients. Actually, you can't do that while you're trashing the climate or you're polluting the environment, or you're breaking the social fabric apart, because ultimately this doesn't lead to a good outcome, nor is it good from our investment returns perspective. And so I think we're in a stage today in 2020 and the last 10 years where we're much clearer on how all of these things are interrelated. And you actually can't achieve one exclusive of the others. And I think we need a sort of more modern view as to what that really means. And I think we're, we're moving in that direction, but, um, but yeah, some clarity would be helpful to move people forward and to, to stop that being a blockage for us. Yeah, and just to come back to you on that slightly, and, and uh, uh, some of the listeners may know that one of the first things that have come out of the Sustainable Finance Forum in their interim report in November last year was a legal clarification of what fiduciary duty means for companies to make it clear that, that they can take action on climate change or sustainability or the environment or, or social issues um, uh, uh, because it's generally in the long-term interest of the, the company to do so. And I think the issue about whether a law change is required is what happens if it's not in their long-term interest. So if a company is polluting the environment and they're getting away with it and they don't stand to benefit, then the current legal terms of fiduciary duty say, well, really the directors kind of have to act in the long-term interests of the company, not in the long-term interests of, of society and the responsibility of that company towards society. I, so so uh, um, it's an interesting point. And I think that, that we will come to I, th I think a stage where a, a, a change to a company law is going to be required in order to make it clear that, for example, corporate social responsibility is what companies should do, even if it doesn't make them money. And that's the piece at the moment that I think is a little bit unclear. Is, is that... Yeah, I think it reflects a bit of an evolving conversation as to what is the purpose of a company and the sort of, we talk a little bit about share a movement from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. And um, my view as someone who sort of worked in environmental economics for a long time is actually 
the long-term economics or the long-term success of a company are generally very well aligned with the long-term sustainability practices or companies who um, manage for broader stakeholders quite well. But I think we've got a challenge in time horizons here. Um, quite often there, you know, there might be long-term investments that deliver long-term better outcomes. Um, but that might mean that a quarterly return cycle for a company may be a bit below its peer who just is exploiting every resource available to itself on a short-term strategy to maximise the share price over the next six months. And so, so I think you're right, there's potential for some trade-offs over certain time horizons, but over the long term, I think there's sort of, you know, it's, it's less and less of an argued position that these things are entirely aligned. And so I, I think whether or not we want to embed that in law, in corporate law, um, you know, I think I would like to think we can move in that direction without that, but no doubt laws and big sticks accelerate change. And so sometimes they are a necessary mechanism to move things along in the right direction and to move them faster. So, so yeah, not, not ruling that out by any means. Yeah. Um, Simon, we've got a question uh, come in, uh, which is again about the engagement versus divestment issue. And, and it quotes a, uh, a Swiss uh, sustainable finance study, I'm not quite sure which one, um, that compares the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of divestment strategies to engagement strategies. And, and the study came out quite strongly in favor of divestment being uh, the most uh, uh, effective uh, way to, to change company behavior. Um, what, what's what's your view? I know I know we've kind of talked around that a bit, but do you do you have um, research that, that that you kind of use to compare between divestment versus ESG as a, are the good sources of, of quantification? Yeah, of look, how that works. Uh, yeah, I think it's 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 great. And it's really interesting to hear of that research. Um, I often think of this as as sort of what's your theory of change here, and what's the outcome you're trying to create and ultimately when I see change being most effectively made or, or, or um, you often have multiple tactics being employed at the same time and so there is no doubt that a that the fact that thermal coal producers for example have become uh, a, a sector that's really strongly divested not just from deep green ethical funds but from major global pension funds this um, even if it hasn't had a direct negative impact on the share price of that company, and sometimes it may have, um, the signal that that's sending is just so impactful and so powerful and has made it quite toxic. For the, and we've seen as a result, a lot of banks stop lending to thermal coal producers globally. And so, so that's had a massive impact and I wouldn't want to um, undermine the importance of that. Um, I do think nonetheless, there's going to be a whole lot of sectors of our economy that have to transition and to achieve Paris, we're going to need to move a whole lot of heavy industrial, sometimes quite dirty industries um, to become less brown and more green. And I think that's going to need some long-term investment support and pressure for that to occur. I mean, the risk here, right, is that you get a, a BHP gets under pressure, just for an example, to divest all of its thermal coal assets because a lot of big investors are saying, we're not gonna hold you anymore because you've got thermal coal. And so they go and they sell their thermal coal mines, which are then bought up by a state owned private company from somewhere in the world who has no scrutiny, who's not under the gaze of, of large investors globally, who just then digs and pollutes and leaves a, a residual mine site that's toxic. And then, you know, is actually sells it to a shell company, disappears, you know, so you've got sort of, some worst case scenarios here that could play out quite poorly as well. And so we've really got to think through what tactics we're using for what effect. And I think often, you know, I think it's really great that there are NGOs scrutinizing investors, that there are investors willing to divest, that there are investors willing to put up resolutions and vote against boards. Um, I think actually we need every point <laughs> uh, if we're going to create change at the rate and scale that we need to create it. Uh, to, to mitigate the worst of climate change and to respond to some of these great pressures and problems. So I'm probably a bit of a sit on the fence response there. And maybe that reflects the fact that I see a role for lots of different parts of the financial sector. I think everyone though has to be totally accountable. Every investor has to be very clear and very accountable to what they're doing, why they're choosing a particular strategy, 
and how they can demonstrate progress by that particular strategy. And I think that's a big area that we need some development in. Great, that's, uh, that's a very good point to, to finish our, our discussion on. Thank you very, very much for that, for that Simon. Um, I want to leave everyone with, uh, with a uh, advanced notice of, of next week. So we have uh, Sir Jonathan Porritt uh, um, coming on to the seminar. Many of you may know Jonathan's got uh, very deep roots in, in New Zealand, has been chair of uh, Air New Zealand's Sustainable Advisory Council, one of the founders of, of uh, uh, the what's called the Aotearoa Circle and the Sustainable Finance Forum. Uh, he's uh, been a real pioneer internationally and mm. uh, um, he, he's uh, written many books uh, and uh, he's coming out with, with one fairly soon. Um, and really his passion is the fierce urgency of climate change. And Jonathan and I are going to be talking about, so what is needed to ramp up the urgency of the transition on climate and where does climate finance fit into that? What's required in order to really start shifting climate finance in the right direction? So that's uh, happening at the same time next week, so 7 p.m. on Wednesday. You can uh, um, get us through uh, this Facebook, uh, through our Facebook page or through uh, Eventbrite uh, invitations or go to Mindful Money's website and we've got uh, uh, the seminars loaded up on, on our website and you can see the video of, of this one if you want to watch it again. Uh, and, uh, and we'll do a summary uh, uh, to put up on the website. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Particular huge thank you to Simon and uh, really appreciate it. And, uh, Ria's doing fantastic work, and it's it's uh, it's always great to to have a discussion with you. So so thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all, and uh, and we'll see you hopefully next week. Great, thanks very much, Barry. Thanks, Simon. See you.